Good evening, everyone. My wire is open for any late word Washington may have on the latest Nazi claim. Well, in radio claims, a U-boat sank our aircraft carrier Ranger. Not a word has come out of Washington regarding it up to half a minute ago. It remains an absolutely unconfirmed enemy claim. Germany, you remember, once claimed it sank our aircraft carrier Wasp, and it proved to be a lie. Germany claimed she sank our battleship Maryland off Brazil. It proved to be a British freighter and another Nazi lie. She claimed her U-boat sank an American cruiser off Norway, and that proved to be a lie. The Ranger is a 14,000-ton ship. She said to normally carry 1,800 men and 80 planes. Hitler may be trying to mar our Easter holiday with some psychological warfare. Here's some news from Tunisia, late news. Another part of Rommel's army may be outflanked tonight. That famous hill known as 648, where there was such bitter fighting earlier in the Tunisian campaign, has been captured by French troops. It's ten miles southwest of Pont du Pont. That's Rommel's last defense line outside Tunis. Nazi propaganda will try hard now to call it von Arnhem's battle in order to persuade us to forget it's Rommel's defeat. But I'll keep reminding you. The handwriting is on the rocky wall outside Tunis tonight. The final breakthrough by General Alexander's army may come at any time. He's cracking Rommel's most powerful line only a few miles outside Tunis. If Anderson's men make it, Tunis may be done for. Hitler would have nothing to show for his 2,000 miles in Africa except possess. One surprise report from Tunisia concerns Lieutenant General Leslie McNair, one of our most brilliant commanders, in charge of all ground operations and stationed in Washington. He was on inspection in Tunisia and wounded Friday. His injury is said to be serious, but his chance of recovery is said to be fair. He's 59 years old. Lieutenant General Ben Lear has been called to Washington for temporary command in McNair's post. Here's one headline Hitler never expected. Allied armies are advancing tonight on the entire Tunisian front, on a front 140 miles wide. Montgomery's initial advance, a tell of mine, you remember, was only five miles wide. By that much, have Allied troops hammered Rommel's men deeper into Coffin Corner. And here's another surprise for Hitler. General Giraud was a Nazi prisoner last October. Tonight his army of 60,000 Frenchmen holds every mile of yesterday's 12-mile advance and drives to within 24 miles of Tunis itself. And a little over 200 days ago, General Montgomery fought to hold his last remaining 40 miles to Alexandria. Tonight Rommel has had to abandon his troops. He's said to be defending, building a new defense line in Sicily. And Montgomery is almost close enough to open his heavy guns on Tunis itself. We've heard a good deal about casualties, ladies and gentlemen, and we shall hear more. We were warned many times to expect heavy casualties in Tunisia. We've had some official figures. Any casualty is heavy for the family to whose home it comes. But our total figure is not considered excessive by any means. Other men coming out of Africa say the full casualties have not been reported. Washington replies all available figures have been given. Any claim to the contrary is said to be based on a misunderstanding. We ought to make desperately sure casualty figures do not become a matter for speculation, rumor, whisper, or contradiction. Surely it's too solemn a matter for that. It was bad enough to have it on such items as rubber, food, or gasoline. Now the matter of shipping losses leaves us puzzled as one government bureau declares firmly, we built more ships than were lost last year. In another bureau, a Senate committee claims we lost more than we built. But add all the raging charge and countercharge on rubber production between Mr. Jeffers and the War Department, you can't help but feel sorry for any man trying to figure it out. We ought to make certain we keep our casualty figures out of any such debate, speculation, rumor, or contradiction. I think we ought to make it a hard and fast rule to confine all discussion of casualties to official figures. I can recall five or six times when we, we were warned casualties would be heavy. It seemed to me many a man must have asked himself as he heard it, I wonder why it's being emphasized so much. Are we being conditioned for some bad news? Are the casualties so heavy that we're being prepared for a shock by this constant emphasis and reiteration? I'm sure that was not our purpose. It was simply that Tunisia was far away, Rommel was on the run. Many people were saying it's all over before it was over. 
Official Washington knew how much hard fighting waited ahead. It was necessary to remind us of it, and emphasis on casualties was our reminder. But when it's overemphasized, when it plays on our nerves night and day, when we get one report in Washington, another reports are brought out by men coming out of Tunisia. Why, then you get doubt, whisper, rumor, and confusion. I say it was bad enough on rubber and gasoline. Surely we'll keep anything as sacred as casualties out of any field of debate or contradiction or even misunderstanding. Our job is to make war on the enemy's nerves and not our own. Seems to me instead of emphasizing casualties which are yet to come, we ought to emphasize all the care and preparations we've made to keep our casualties as low as possible. We ought to make it plain casualty figures include a great many men who are missing or taken prisoner or wounded. We ought to hear more about all the brilliant work our medical men are doing and how much new scientific knowledge is doing to save life and limb even after a man has been wounded. Surely we owe that to millions who are holding a long vigil here at home. Yes, there will be casualties. And there will be miracle-like healing and reunion, too. Hitler and Tojo combined failed to cut down New York's Easter parade today. Three quarters of a million persons turned out in what experts call the most colorful Easter parade in Manhattan's history. Tomorrow we'll see the photographs of coming passions for the ladies. Well, for a man, a face sparkling fresh is all good fashion, isn't it? Man can't possibly ask for a better calling card than a face sparkling fresh. And Barbasol does leave your face sparkling fresh every time for its shaving at its best. Not just occasionally, but ten times in ten, one hundred times in every hundred. Union leaders representing 50,000 men talk of walking out next week unless a new contract is agreed upon. John Lewis is said to be in New York and gives no indication of going before the Wall Labor Board. And here's a suggestion respectfully offered to congressmen who are home for Easter vacation. Drop in on Mr. X, who lives in your town, Mr. Congressman. You'll recognize his home by the flag in his window, a flag and a star, and perhaps two. Ask to meet Mrs. X. Ask her what people are talking about. And she'll probably tell you they're talking about prices the cost of food. Ask her how she manages and she'll probably reply, heaven alone knows. For you see, Mr. Congressman, Mr. X is one of millions of Americans whose salaries are where they were two, three, four, five, and ten, and twenty years ago, whose cost of living has gone up shockingly high. Mr. and Mrs. X and their children, for whom the war has meant only pain and difficulty and a day and night struggle to keep afloat. Mr. and Mrs. X, who've had no wartime wages, no wartime profits. America's forgotten family. Forced to give up more and more things every day and just hang grimly on. Mr. Congressman, when you get back to Washington, you'll be asked to vote for a withholding tax to check inflation. It's due May 3rd, according to reports tonight. A tax to hold back at least a part of billions of excess dollars people are pouring out in a mad rush to buy things. Can you vote an anti-inflation tax against Mr. X? Are there any excess dollars at his home? Is he helping to cause any inflation? Can he possibly stand a reduction of another penny in his present tight fix, let alone 20%? He'll give you his last dollar for liberty. He gave his boy. He's giving anything and everything his country calls for. His people have been in every front line whenever America calls. How are we going to tax a man against inflation? When actually he's so badly deflated by higher living costs, he can't possibly get by now. Gentlemen of Congress, are we going to pass a blanket withholding tax? Are we going to deduct 20% of all salaries? Treating alike cases where income may have gone up two and three times as much as it was a year or two years ago. And others where it hasn't gone up a dollar in years. Homes where a head of lettuce is becoming a rarity. Where the common lowly everyday vegetables cost enough to be locked in a vault. Where meat is only a member. I heard of a school teacher recently in a small American town who went to a bank to cash her salary check. Can I have it in new money, please, she asked. The teller behind the window smiled. Afraid of germs? Mister, she replied... A germ could never live on what my salary will buy at present prices. 
Ladies and gentlemen, Marshal Dane. Thank you, Gabriel Dieter. Men, did your face sing or did it sing after your shave this morning? If you weren't completely satisfied, get yourself some famous Barbasol shaving cream. 